Is that our signal that we should start? I don't know. Is that our signal? I don't know. Yep. She just gave it. <laughs> hey, thanks for being here this morning. Thanks for <laughs> joining us here in person or online. Thanks for being a part of our service this morning. So we're just going to get things started by some worship this morning. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough. You came along and put me back together. is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Bones into 
Everybody, thank you guys so much for being here. I am gonna hop down there to give some announcements real quick. Could have gone a better way. That's cool. Okay, so I have some quick announcements before we do another game. We're doing a lot of games this series. So, first off, we have our Kid Spot Cafe that has been kicked off this series. It has been going so well. I don't know if you guys have heard the laughter that's been coming in through those doors during the message, but it is awesome. And we are so grateful for Lori and her girls just championing that and really pouring into our kids. Um, once again, that is the Kid Spot Cafe. And after the Kid Spot video from Joe, the kids are released and then they go in there for some activities and then uh, they learn a couple Bible verses that actually correspond with what we're learning in here as well. So you can talk to your kids at that. Um, so that's super cool. And we're really excited as that continues to develop. Our next announcement is intercessory prayer training and night of worship. So if you feel like you are being called to deeper prayer in your life, be a part of our intercessory prayer training. This on Saturday, February 27th. Um, it's going to be from 5 to 6 p.m. here in the worship space. And we actually have the chance to um, have our good friend Deanne Eddie. You've probably seen her around. She visits about once a month. She's going to be leading us learning about intercessory prayer and how God has called us to be praying for our body here at Alive. Um, and then following that training, there will be a night of worship. And that's going to be awesome. If you attended our last night of worship, this is going to be similar, but we are so excited to do another one. We haven't done one in a while, and it's going to be a night of just opening our hearts to God and worshiping and praising him and also just prayer coming off of that prayer meeting. We can just open our hearts to pray through that worship. So we invite you to be a part of that as well. So that's going to be from six to seven right after that. And then we are having a communication breakthrough. So we announced this last when he uh, was doing announcements. We have app called Church Center, and we're going to use this to better communicate with you guys um, for signups and midweek things. So if you go to your app store on your phone or your tablet, whatever, um, you can download the app Church Center, and then you can register under a live church. So it'll say find your church, and you just type in a live church or our address, and it will pop up, and you can be a part of our directory there. So watch for more directions coming your way, or be sure to ask one of our leaders here um, about that to get set up today or if you need help. And without further ado, we have a game for you all. So first, I need four very willing volunteers. Natalie, thank you for volunteering. Uh, let's see, we got Mary, come on down. You're a nice volunteer. Keith, you're a nice volunteer too. And uh, Becky, why don't you come on down? Come on down. You are the next contestant on The Price is Right. I'll stand up here since I don't have a mask. My lovely assistant, Jordan, is here today with our all of our objects. Can you get the... <laughs> yes, thank you. So in true Price is Right fashion, we have three volunteers. Where's the fourth one? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on down. And Jordan's going to bring out our first item, which we're going to be guessing what the price is. You can 
line up here as well. Um, sorry about that. And are facing that way, yes. So item, or items, I should say, that Jordan will you shortly, are two Sherpa hooded sweatshirts. We have a maroon one and a gray one. And before we get started, we'd like to say that everything that we're using today is going to be donated to our awesome partnership, Almost Home. So that is another place where you can give your donations. But for these two Sherpas, what is your guess? We can't tell you where we bought them. Okay, Becky, you want to go first. What is your guess? Both combined, yes, both combined. 65, Natalie? 40, Keith? 50, and Mary? 45, so all of you were over. It was 39.98. So we're gonna do one more to see if any of you to go on with the show. Yeah, go yeah, you guys, come on, you gotta be, you have have to have a strategy here. All right, so our next item that will hopefully get one of you on the board up here is a 12 inch, oh, 10 inch frying pan. It has ceramic stone on the inside. So, once again, let's start with Becky. What is your guess? One dollar. <laughs> Natalie. 1999. <laughs> we'll take a wild guess. 24 from Keith and Mary. 29.99 is the exact price. Continuing. Thank you for playing. Mary, you will be in the room. Thanks for playing. So, Mary. She does? Does that come out of your wallet or mine? Because that depends. <laughs> so our next game is going to be uh, you have to order all, you have to place the items in front of these boards. There's no trick questions. They are all on here. And you get the chance for X chances if you don't get it's right on the first try. Jordan has a beanbag toss that he has set up, and every beanbag you get in the hole is an extra chance for another guess. So we've got four prices up here, $3.99, $5.99, $9.99, and $10.99. And we're going to give you four extra shots here to have the potential for extra chances. So no, 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 no. You stand right here, Mary. I got on you. Okay. So you have four chances. Everybody, let's cheer her on. Let's give her some encouragement here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just try to get it in there. Oh, close. That's a very steep board, Jordan. <laughs> oh, she's got one extra shot. <laughs> And two extra shots. Awesome. So these are our four objects here. We've got some downy free and gentle detergent. We've got a pack of 25 Huggies diapers. We've got Crest 3D white radiant mint toothpaste. And we have some honey. So you get two extra chances to line them all up perfectly in front of their prices. So go ahead. <laughs> Take your best guess. And you can use and you can use the audience for your help as well. So if audience members you know or you think you know, no cheating of course, but you can help out Mary. Feel free. Is this your final thing for their first guess? She is not correct. <laughs> you 
actually have all of them out of order. So you have two, you have two chances to get it right. So use the audience for some help. Somebody saying switch the toothpaste and a honey. Switch that. Mm-hmm. All right, she's made her first switch with the detergent and the diapers. All right, is this your final answer? Mary, you are correct. You won. The price is right. And you have also won a Hustle, Pray, Eat shirt, which are a hot commodity now. I just heard that they're in a mall. So you can, after the service, go up to the info desk and get your Hustle, Pray, Eat t-shirt. Thank you so much for playing. Guys, let's give her a round of applause. Did you hear me say thanks, Salem? I hope so. I don't know if my mic was on, but um, I just love that we're doing those games and getting those times to have that family game time together. It's like super cool on Sunday mornings. So um, we're going to move into our time of worship. And as we worship, it's, um, it's an expression of our faith in God. Um, and God acts when his people wait for him. Our waiting on him is a demonstration of our faith, um, and it can be hard, but it's by that faith that, that we believe and we expect God to move in our lives. Over and over again, he makes, he makes awesome things happen in our lives in unexpected ways and at unexpected times. And we've seen that here. We know that that's a part of our story and what's happening around here. I just think it's, it's so cool that we, we serve... Um, such an active and living God who is just waiting to pour out his blessings on us when we're faithful and waiting for him. So as we lift up these next songs, we're just proclaiming that we're, we're waiting for him and we believe he's going to come here and move again in our story today. i mm-hmm. 
giants move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear I will speak to my doubt You were faithful then You'll be faithful now You make mountains move Giants fall, you use songs of praise to shake prison walls, and I will speak to my fear, I will speak to my doubt. You faithful then, you'll be faithful now. You were faithful then, and you'll be.
trust what you say that you're good and your love was great I'm broken inside I give you my life oh I give you my life oh I may be weak but your spirit's strong Your spirit strong in me, and my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. You never will. Oh Lord, you never fail. God, thank you so much for being so faithful with us. Thank you so much for never failing us. Thank you for ending in victory over us, God, when we are weak, when we are, feel defeated. You have the victory, and thank you that we can have faith that you will conquer all and that you will guide us through all and you will be faithful through all. So God, as we go into this service, I pray that you would just allow us to be faithful to you because your perfect love and your perfect faithfulness is something that we honor and we praise you for and we worship you for and all of our glory goes to you, God. So thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Check out this cool kid spot from Joe. Hey guys, how you doing? Joe here, outside, very cold. So hanging out here in Toyland, I have some advice for you. If you own any toys, you should always carry a toy phone with you because you don't know if there's an emergency and the toys will need to get a hold of you, so always carry a phone. So listen, the other day I was doing some things and I get a call and it's my friend Sally and she's like, hey Joe, how's it going? Good. And uh, she's like, listen, I'm really worried about our friend Billy Bob. I'm like, Billy Bob, oh, I love that guy. What's, what's, what's wrong? He's like, you know, let me just explain what happened. It's like, we were playing, and we go into the barn, and he's like, look at all this. And it's just filled, just filled with stuff. And Sally's like, what is all this stuff? He's like, listen, this is so awesome. He's like, check this out. I got things that start with I. I got these things that will I'll never get lost ever, 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 ever. I can, I can listen on this police scanner to what the police are saying. I got this thing that I can, that I use for when I walk. Man, you know, I even got this thing. I don't, I have no idea what this is. I open it up and it says Kenny G mixtape. I'm like, that's so cool. Who's Kenny G? I don't know, but it's neat. I even bought a mouse and I, I thought I was getting a real mouse, but they sent me this. I don't know what to do with it, uh, but it's still pretty cool. And she's like, ah, wow, that is a lot of stuff. And so she asked, I'm like, does this, make you happy and how did you get this she's like listen i get this like um i just speak into the clouds and this woman alexa says well, okay and her minions the amazonians send it to me and they're like right at my door and i am so happy every single time i open it. it's like do you know all the stuff you have well she's like well there's a lot of stuff stacked on a lot of stuff so i don't see the stuff on the bottom so i I, I, I don't know. And, and so uh, when she called me, she was like, I, I'm really worried about Billy Bob. That I think he's missing the point. And she's like, she told me, you know, I learned in church this, is that, that God owns everything. He created everything. He owns everything. And his word even says something like this, that he sustains everything, that he holds everything and keeps everything going. And that... He wants us to trust him completely with our lives and not, not look to stuff and the accumulation, getting stuff to make us happy, that we'll try true happiness in a relationship with him. In fact, she said, I, I heard the other day that his word says this, that, that God uh, 
says, test me, or I challenge you to trust me. And, uh, and she's so right. She's so right. You know, if, if, if Sally and Billy Bob had songs, you know, had theme songs, his song would probably sound like this. Me, 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 right? And Sally's would probably be like, Jesus, Jesus, right? And so, um, and so, she's so she's so concerned because as as much stuff as he has, it doesn't seem to make him happy unless he's getting more stuff. And so, um, so we're gonna take. Uh, Billy Bob out for pancakes, and I mean, we're just going to talk to him. We're going to open God's Word, and we're going to show him like where what he says and how he wants us to trust him. He even wants us to give back to him, and and that's part of that trust that we have that he knows what's best. So, uh, also we're going to look at the return policies we got going on with some of this stuff, and maybe we can unclutter his life and uh, and help him out. So, so listen, guys, we're going to learn a little bit more about God's Word in the Kids Spot Cafe, and I will see you guys later. So, uh, we're off to pancakes and and God's Word. So, we'll talk to you guys later. All right, bye bye. Deal. We were, I don't want people to be honest right now, but usually we're into being honest, because if we were being honest, how many of you get the message, right? You, you get the message, you could go on with your day, but instead I step up and then I talk about that same message for about 30 more minutes, probably leading to more confusion than clarity that Joe just delivers to us through Fisher Price and Play School kind of animations. So don't be honest you know, with whether you're really ready to go, you feel like you got the message yet. Just put on a seatbelt, buckle up, and we're gonna go a little bit deeper into this same concept of thinking about stewardship is one way to talk about it. Uh, thinking about finances and money, that's another way to talk about it. But with the course of this series, InstaFam, and thinking about how God calls us to build family in today's world, the word we're really going to focus on is actually wealth. So again, today, whether you're in this place or joining us on live stream, we're continuing our series, InstaFam, Building Family God's Way in Today's World. And the big idea is this kind of counter reality to the culture is that family built God's way does not happen in an instant. It is not something you can order on Amazon and have delivered in two days because you are a prime member. It's not something you can go out and buy your way to the family that you want to be. It's rather following the biblical patterns that God gives us in our lives is the only way to really go after that. And like we're talking through the four weeks of this series, only through generational thinking, a Christ-like submission throughout the whole household, understanding that wealth is built and it's something that involves stewardship and money and finances, but it's kind of God's word for all of that stuff, and it has to be built for the long haul. And lastly, this, this pattern and these practices to build into our lives of celebrating things together from generation to generation, that's how we discover family being built God's way. At the heart of the series is we hope that we can gain a wider, longer, deeper uh, perspective on this importance of building family uh, God's way in this crazy insta world that we're living in. So today, again, that the word is wealth, and that is actually a good word. Money, it, it can have problems. Finances can have problems. But wealth is real biblical, and God is into wealth. Some quick definitions diving into this then would be pretty important. When I'm talking about wealth, ultimately, it would be defined by things you own. Okay, that, that is wealth. The things that we own in our life start to define our, our wealth. And God is into that. God is into giving us things. God is into giving us means to have things that we own and are ours because God, God did that. It was he, he provided. And when we have those kind of things that we, we own and we realize they're from God or he gave us the means to be able to get those, that's amazing stuff. 
Stuff can be amazing when it has come from God and we know it's from him or we know we obtained it because he gave us the means to be able to get that. that that's, amazing. that's called like blessing and goodness and love in our lives. Wealth is, is a good thing. What is not a good thing would be debt because debt would be like the antithesis of wealth. I define debt is defined by the things that then own you. If you, if you have debt, as we will talk about, in like in different proportions and this kind of stuff, but ultimately debt is the stuff that owns you when God's way for stuff is it would be stuff that you own that he's given you and he's given you the means to be able to obtain. That is like the antithesis of that because that would be the stuff that you have that God hasn't given you the means to get or to obtain yet, but you went ahead and got it. Like Billy Bob. Was that the guy? Billy Bob and his cool haircut. Yeah, two, two very different pictures. Biblically speaking, wealth, it would be what God has given you and given you the means to possess. I love that stuff. I had, man, the first thing I think of, what, what have I really owned in my life? that had value and meaning, it was a Ford, like 2004, no, it had to be like in the 90s, because that would have been earlier. It was like at least a 15-year-old Ford Escort that I paid $400 for, and I had $400 to pay that for that Escort. I had had actually two previous cars that I had obtained via debt that I kind of despised, I despised, the Honda Accord was decent. I didn't hate it, but I knew it kind of owned me more than I owned it because of its payment that was coming due and what that did to my finances. But the Ford Escort, like, I owned it. I regularly would hit the dashboard and be like, I own you. I own, you are mine. I don't owe anyone for you. You're a little rickety, but I don't care because I own you and I feel like God has given you to me and I've had the means to obtain you and I don't owe anyone anything for it. That I, I was wealthy because I owned a vehicle. That, not that way. You're owned by it and it's kind of a cultural thing that we end up owned by things. We go out and we, we get it on our own and how we're able to get it is so dependent on our next paycheck to keep it. That can usually tell you what you own versus what owns you. If you need the next paycheck to keep it, it probably owns you. Enter the Mercury Villager that I referenced. No wisdom, no in like, I don't think, I think I was humble enough to never blame God for it, but it was like about a three-day decision that we needed that. We had had Drew, so we're a family of three. How do you not have a minivan if you're a family of three? Where do you put the kid if you don't have a minivan possible for seating of seven because the grandparents may want to ride with you sometime? And how could you have good family values if you don't have a minivan, especially if your parents just called you, said they're going to Gulf Shores and invited you for basically a free stay? And I, I, don't, I don't think I had the escort at that time. I'm not sure it could have made it to Gulf Shores. But somehow, Andrea and I concocted this radical need for a Mercury Villager that we bought over the course of three days. And we were there. We're like, oh, man, I hope God opened some doors and some things like that. God did not open any doors. It was all self that we acted on to obtain a Mercury Villager for some $16,000 for a $340 a month car payment that we thought we could handle. And bottom line is, we got owned. We absolutely got owned. And something that is somehow a part of this that creates this problem and this counterculture that it's so hard to do things God's way, to wait on him and actually have the means that he's given us. A, enjoy what you have because it's so much already. Stop looking over the fence at what else and what's next. Where does that all come from, that cultural pull that takes us to debt away from wealth, which is what God has intended for us? I think we have to bring the American dream into the conversation, right? The American dream, somehow we get entangled in that. We're a part of it, but we sit a part of it, right? Apart from it, 
because we follow Christ and we're about the kingdom and we live in a, you know, a love God and love other kind of mentality and that's the culture. But the American dream culture that also does affect us somehow like just wrecks and contain. And maybe it's something we can manage if we love God enough and balance it. But, but check this out. The American dream is technically defined as the idea that no matter where you come from, if you work hard enough and pursue your dreams, you will have the opportunity to live a happy and self-sufficient life. Anyone from anywhere, you can have that. You can. You can do it. You can have that. You can obtain that. If you work hard enough, if you, you, know, you figure it all out, it's yours. And there seems like there's something virtuous about the, that statement of the American dream, right? There seems like that's something beautiful and good, and there, there are things within it, but the other things that aren't of the kingdom that are within it that we get tangled in ruin us. They wreck us. It's counter to what God has for us in, in our lives. It's not about wealth. It becomes some other chase. I got to go here a minute because this is the real problem. Ultimately, again, it's the culture that we're battling. It's the culture that doesn't know, like breed and build God's way. It, it pulls on us and it tempts us to live short of what we're called to in our life. But to understand the enemy is an important part of like uh, the victory, right? Nick and I just watched The Last Samurai. Oh, right. Understanding the enemy is what it's all about. And the enemy is this culture that pulls us the other way. So three big words. Individualism materialism and consumerism. If you want to know the definition of our culture, and we can call it accidental, but the American dream has bred this culture that has led to this rugged individualism, I, me, me, like poor Billy Joe. Billy Bob, Billy Bob? thank you, thank you. That. <laughs> Man, how, how could I mess that up? Um, rugged individualism, me-centered materialism. It's about our possessions and goods and consumerism, which is just about getting and getting the next. Because what we got doesn't even satisfy what we're really after. Individualism. And again, I feel like the counter to individualism that our culture breeds is what the great commandment's supposed to breed is like love God and love others. It's, it's not about you and yours and me and mine and getting what I want to get. That would lead to like a horrible dog-eat-dog -dog culture. You would like find those who have getting more and those that don't have get less and there's a bigger gap that happens because advantage starts to play into the mix. And then like who's looking out for who? And the American Jew, you got to look out for you and get what's yours and otherwise you're not a hard worker in this. But that's not of the kingdom. The kingdom of, is a love God and love people. Not individualism, it's God and others. And it's like it should be a devastating war going on if we feel like we're dabbling a little bit in the individualism and going after what we want and we deserve. Again, we deserve that minivan. Andrew and I were just good young kids. We deserve that thing, having a third child. Where were we going to stuff them? Into some four seater with the three of us? That <laughs> That's just how we trick ourselves to be in there and ending up there and getting there is crazy. So that individualism becomes this horrible dog eat dog thing so counter to what we say we're, we're living for and living by. Materialism, somehow if there are virtues and you know, great values in the American dream, somehow they get polluted because they get shifted. What we're actually going for are possessions and goods become that measurement of happiness. No longer like heart, soul, and mind and relationship with God and relationship with one another and peace and, you know, just uh, celebrating what God has done in the means of what he has given us. We become this possessions and goods and the Joneses and keeping up with them and having what we have and how nice is it and how does it compare. And comparing is a horrible trap because you either end up prideful because you got more or you're like pity party because you have less. The Joneses will ruin you and having your eyes on them, but that's what materialism breeds. And then consumerism, and actually the opposite, if we're talking the kingdom, 
If it's the world, it's individualism and it's materialism. It's supposed to be God and others in generosity. Generosity like of kindness and care for other people around you. That's like the virtue that's supposed to be bleeding out of us as we love God and as we love people. And then lastly, this consumerism defined by the ability to get and to get more. It's where the me monster comes from. It's, you know, giving in to this insatiable want and this desire for more. Isaiah 58 talks about it. You'll end up buying all kinds of things with your money, and you will end up laboring for all kinds of things that will not satisfy what you are looking for. You are trying to provide it for your family, but you are going to the wrong side of the fence to try to deliver that. No way will it come through individualism, materialism, consumerism, there's a shot, and what God's way is through loving him and others and being generous because you're others-oriented and thinking of God and his kingdom and you're full of compassion and mercy and keeping everyone, you know, having what God has provided, which is enough. There is enough to go around if we weren't hoarding and hogging and becoming consumed by us. What's horrible is this image just slays me. Because, oh, it hurts, but it is so true. What the American dream ultimately leads to is this work, buy, consume, and die culture. And that's what owns you when you are owned by it. Everything is working to buy. Forget what you have. It's old. It doesn't entertain anymore. It doesn't do what it did because it was actually the instant gratification, like adrenaline little buzz. We don't even know that, but that's what fueled it, and that's actually what we're after. So we buy, and then we consume and use it. I, always, I was thinking when Joe, or it might have been what uh, Salem was saying, of you, you leave the toy you have to play with the box. That hurts as a parent when you've you know, done the ultimate Christmas for your kid, and within 10 minutes they leave the toy and they're playing with the box. That's painful. But we end up in this work, buy, consume, die culture that we basically live lives that were then owned. We're slaves to the, the world and the work and the paychecks and that. And then we hate it because it's not supposed to be that way. Our heart, our soul, our mind can't actually stand that. At best, we can keep it going a little bit and fake ourselves out. But that's why families are just devastated by finances. One of the leading causes of divorces are the fighting over finances. It wrecks a marriage because divorce happens, and that wrecks generations. And we need generations for family to be built God's way. If, if there aren't grandparents and parents and kids and their kids and generations going back and forth, if that gets shattered, then we don't have the shot at what God has created for us. We're not going to be able to see it that way. What needs to ultimately happen is like a radical mind shift to get, escape that culture of the American dream that has bred this individualism, this materialism, and this consumerism and get back to like the kingdom of God and living for that in our lives. That's about loving God and loving others and being generous. If we have anything, we first think of others and what we could do in goodwill that could come to them out of compassion and mercy with what we have. And then wealth, yes, that's a part of it because you, you have, we have so much. We have so much. And we've, we've got to get out of the culture we're in and into the life and the land. I love the Old Testament and just the metaphor of land. The land that God has for you to go into, enter, and to possess you got to live for these other values. And that's what God's word is for and helps us do. Around here, we're into memory verses. Meditating on word, on verses that God gives us to help our minds be transformed so we don't conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but we get transformed by the renewing of our mind because then we can test and approve of what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will that has nothing to do with a mercury villager. If you keep the mind built and the mind going. So Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Let this start lacing and lining your brain. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth. 
with the first fruit of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Like in the kingdom, and like a love God and love others and be generous and think of what you have as wealth because God has given it to you. You, you have that or you had the means that you have a job and you love your job because your, your job is your means to the, the things that you need in your life that God does have for you. But it, it can't be you for you. It's you for God and you for others and you being generous. And then you will realize this stuff that you have is amazing. Meditating on that verse, having that in your mind versus the commercialism and the, um, the materialism of our world inundating us, the, the number of messages we get for the American dream versus the kingdom. It's not even fair. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 is another great one. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The mean monster will end up devouring themselves. If you're all greedy and needy and hoarding and that kind of stuff, that will come back on you. But whoever sows generously also reaps generously, and you know that. You have seen better examples of generosity than greed in our life. So why do you keep choosing greed? Phil, in the mirror in a morning. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, like helping others, seeing needs, not reluctantly or under compulsion as if you've got like white knuckle hold on your stuff. For God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you would know that if you would stop, you know, get your eyes back home having all that you need and abounding in every good work and every good thing that God has filled your life with. And the, the best perspective, so much of what this leads back to is the relationship stuff because you have a satisfied heart, mind, and soul because your relationship with God and you're living the way he calls you to. And then because your relationship is good and right with God, the ability to have good relationships with those closest to you marriages and the family dynamics and parents and siblings and all that stuff. When, when, you are, when you are right with God, it's so much easier to be right with people. And all that goodness starts to overwhelm you. And if everyone in that community of lives is caring about God and others, they're not worried about themselves. And you're so blessed in that space. Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. And if it's American dream entangled and that's what your eyes are always on and what actually has a hold of your heart and it's those things that really matter versus the true like virtues and values of the kingdom, good luck. Good luck. I like Acts 20, 35. just shows the bend towards the others. And everything I did, this is... I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I'm trying to think of when, when is my work and um, value, like valuing uh, money in a way that I know I will be able to do something for others. And as parents, that, like, that I think is what drives us to work every day is we're providing for our family. That's such a good thing. We love work because it lets us do this. We can give to our family because God's allowing us uh, you know, to work and then have a means to do that. That's such a good thing, and it needs to be what's driving us always. And when we're fine, then we look outward to the next. We're the weak, the poor, the vulnerable, those in need, those that are suffering. We'd be driven and aware that there are people in our midst that are like that, that we could be helping. So those are just like great verses to be thinking about. Let those transform your mind so that we're not, you know, giving into this way of the world and being pulled by that. How we change our ways is by changing what we think. And then we change what we think, then we can start to change what we do. And as we change how we think, we change who we are. And we can become who and how God calls us to be. A little more application to, to help us in this, right? And really, this issue is too many times. It's so sad that, like, wealth and finances and money, it's usually in the church. It's only talked about in the worship service. 
Because like that's where the offering is taken and it's all about the offering. That is not true. Actually, finances and money and wealth, it should be a discipleship issue. It should be in and among. I'm always talking about who are your three accountability partners. How are they helping you become who and how you want to be? How's, how's your wealth these days? That would be like a great discipleship question. Not for the pastor to ask a whole bunch of people, but like eyeball to eyeball with a coffee in hand and concern for a marriage and a family and a household. If we know these things, we would go after that kind of stuff and not just leave it to a Sunday morning issue, but make it a discipleship deal. These are some tools that are helpful on that kind of path. I'm sure many of you have heard of like God's plan being kind of the 10, 10, 80. And that, that's like just biblical wisdom. If you read the cover or the Bible cover to cover and see what God's pattern for handling finances and money and wealth, that you get this pattern of 10, 10, 80. 10% is the tithe back to God. Again, because we, we love God and we love people and we know that the gospel and his work and this message and the kingdom culture, that has to be spread in this world. So, so we would give to something that we know is helping that happen in this world because we know that's the hope of the world. That's the hope of lives in this world is knowing that and that message. So with anything we have from God or he's given us the means to have, we would be like giving back first and foremost to that. The second 10% would be like to yourself and to like thinking of rainy days and emergencies or possibly things down the road that you want to have that he's given you the means of income. So save that and, and wait for that. Um, Susan talked about in the first service, I forgot all about layaway. Does layaway register with anyone? Does anyone remember when you could buy things on layaway? That's so crazy today. Who would wait to pay for what you're trying to buy until you've paid for it to have it like you would end up owning it? That'd be horrible because right now you can go get anything and it can own you. That's like, that's, if you're thinking like our culture, you're like, that is just silly. No, it's like that. But you would put money away until you could get the things you'd have, and then you would own them. And that was very different than the credit card culture we're living in. And then 80% of what you have is like you live at that level because that's your means. Or actually, you could choose to live, live below that once you realize you have what you need. And you could think about being that much more generous or saving for other things or, again, loving God, loving others in some other way. That's that basic 10, 10, 80. The tithe verse um, that's a lot of times looked at, Malachi 3, 10. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That's what the, so many love this verse because it's a test God. Like you can actually test God. Give this, you know, live this way and see if it doesn't happen. See if it, like his way in this life that he calls us to and what he says it is like, see if it doesn't happen. If you live his way, if you commit to that 10% and giving that back and letting go of like your stuff enough to be generous like that. That's such an awesome verse that calls us to that. And as people following Christ, it, this is how you break free of that other culture is give like this. Order your finances like this. 10% to God. The second 10% savings, Proverbs 21, 20. The wise store up choice food and olive oil. They store it up. They have it. They're not using it. They're not consuming it. They're not thinking about the next, but it, it, it's stored. It, it, it's value. It's like choice food, and it's really good stuff. Most of that stuff you can't get in a, in a minute. You can't insta-order that kind of stuff. You save for it. I always think of furniture. My grandparents bought furniture for a lifetime. One dining room table, one sofa, one break front, one bedroom set for life. Who would do that? Who would want the same thing for your whole life? If you pay $29.99, you can use that thing for at least three months. It'll break down then, but then you can get new. And then you can buy more and get new because it breaks down. Like this cheap stuff, we get so foolish. I'm talking to me. I'm talking to me, right? But man, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp down theirs. 
Fools get caught up in this work by consume die culture, and it's just foolishness. I love 2 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 for this 80% mentality. I, this, this would probably be my favorite passage of this whole message because there's such goodness in this one. Write this one down. But godliness with contentment is great. Contentment. That's a million dollar word right there. You should, if, you, if you can buy contentment, you ought to pay a million bucks right now for it because it is what your heart and your soul and your mind are looking for. It's when they become satisfied because you're okay with what God has given you and the means that you have you know, to, to obtain things. You feel great. You feel overwhelmed. You feel like you have enough. It's not about the chase and the rat race anymore. You're content, and that is great gain in life and in marriages and in families to have that. For we, bought nothing, for we brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out of it. There are not trailer hitches on coffins, as many pastors like to joke. But if we have food and clothing, we will be constant with that, or we'll be content with that. I have a hard trouble time saying it. It's probably like a Freudian slip or something. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires of individualism, consumerism, and materialism, and that plunges people into ruin and destruction. Why would we settle for that? Why would we let that into our lives and into our homes? For the love of money... Notice it's the love of money, not money, is the root of all kinds of evil. Because it's the love of money that drives the individualism, the materialism, and the consumerism. It's that desire that you see God's way, but you like, no, I can have mine now. And we abort mission and go for it. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It's us doing it to us. It's insane. The 10, 10, 80 and writing those numbers down and then starting to put that into practice is how you, you break the mindset, how you break the cycle. As you get with your discipleship, your life group, those that are close to you, you talk with your spouse, you talk as a household about these things because these are the things that are supposed to be written on our door frames and our posts. They're what's tied to our, our wrists and our hands and we talk about them when we go and when we come and when we wake and when we sleep, that th this is that stuff. I had some Dave Ramsey tips, but look up Dave Ramsey and follow his baby steps. They're really cool. What I want to jump to, really, that they would follow up if you have a hard time applying the 1010 or getting into it. Dave Ramsey's baby steps help create a, a path and a pattern to get there and move towards that. But I, wanna, I just want to jump right now to this commitment card that is around here. This is for you and your refrigerator. You are not turning it in. You are accountable to God, not me. Thank you very much. I will not take responsibility for that. Um, but this is, this is how I've seen it work. This is how it works in the discipleship journey. It's, it's like a discipleship path and applying these things is, is like the how we do it. We don't just, we do pray about it and we do fill our minds with this kind of word to inform us about it. But then as we walk it out, here are real tools that help us. As a family, committing to build wealth for the long haul is take three days where you commit to take those three days to make a 10, 10, 80 plan and develop a budget. If you do not have a budget for every dollar you are running the risk of being greatly foolish and ending up in your own demise and the culture winning the war for your heart. Three days. It can't, you can't do it this afternoon. I guarantee you, you cannot go home and get the 10, 10, 80 plan and develop your every dollar budget in like an hour. That's an insta thought. It doesn't happen in an insta, right? three days to kind of get it together and regroup and think about where you are and where you want to be, defining your 10, 10, 80, and then the budget. Dave Ramsey has really good tools for that as well. Three weeks then is a commitment to working your plan and managing that budget diligently for three weeks. 
<laughs> I laughed out loud. Susan talked about reconciling the checkbook. Remember when those checkbooks had ledgers and you wrote how much money you were giving someone and then that check, you know, did something you actually used and exchanged that. And she talked about reconciling that ledger daily. Like that is such a foreign concept in our culture that daily paying attention to your finances, that's why, that's crazy talk. It's, it's fine, it's going, I'm going. There's Visa, there's Discover, there's, there's, other, there's other ways to do it. You don't have to pay attention to every dollar. Yeah, you do. And do that for three weeks of being committed to that. It takes that. You will not do it. If you just try this week and see what happens, it won't work. Three days to get the plan, three weeks to initially start out on it. This is just like good habit, starting new habits, training your ways for new, uh, yourself for new ways in your life stuff, and then three months, commit to working that three-week plan out for three months, and then see if God isn't good for his word. That's what Malachi 3.10 says. Test me in this. But the this is this. Three days to get the plan and the 10, 10, 80 and three weeks of applying that and then three months. If we did that in this room, we would have crazy stories of the transition from the individualism, materialism and consumerism of our culture to the craziness of what happens in our lives as we become loving God and loving other generous people that start to realize we do have great wealth because we do have so much already. Many would even start offloading stuff in a crazy way. So that's the challenge today. Have that conversation as a household to think about the long haul, to think about God and his kingdom and his love and his goodness reigning in your marriage and in your family and the difference that that would make. So as Ronald and Salem come up to close us with one more, gardens to graves, graves to gardens. Grave, individualism, materialism, consumerism. That's guaranteed to be the grave. The garden that God has created for us is this loving God, loving others, this generous picture of who we want to be and how we want to be in this world, that then God's wealth, God's and us seeing that which he has given us and that which he has given us the means to possess starts to become ours. So Father God, we thank you so much for your word that paints this picture for us. It started in a garden and it's all about getting back to that kind of garden and live in the way that you've called us to. I pray very specifically for our body those here gathered this morning, those watching on live stream, this is such an important thing. Help us be diligent. Help us be faithful. Help us be bold and courageous in following you to talk about the things we need to talk about to get help. To get help to move towards the life you're calling us to. To reach out. Do that kind of work in us and help us move from the graves of this world to the garden that you create for us. So we love you, we thank you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing turn our graves into gardens show us that all the treasures that we've been searching after in this world are nothing compared to you we just want you Lord we just want you to fill our lives just more of you and we just pray that you would bring new life in a, in a clear path by just opening the floodgates in our lives and pouring out your blessings on us, Lord. So we give our hearts to you this morning. We're just so thankful for um, who you are, your promises to us, the joy that you want to bring us, Lord. We just we just pray that, um, that you would be just bringing new life in our lives and help us to uh, turn our hearts and, and surrender to that. Um, thank you for what you're doing this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a great week.